Well, it is my pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Schuler, who I told him I was going to introduce him as a friend of the family because he is. Actually, way back when, when we started with pop therapy, he was really influential in helping Pablo Paredes design his interventions. I remember Pablo being on the phone with you for hours talking about how to design real psychological interventions that people would actually use. So he's here, but he's here from the University of Northwestern, Northwestern University, from the Department of Preventative Medicine and the Center for Behavioral intervention technologies, or they call it CBIT. He's also a director of a, remind me the name of it again? Cyber Guide, right, which is a super useful tool. Um, The thing that's interesting about Stephen is he really works on making mental health and well-being interventions accessible and universally available to all, which uh, we love here. So I'm sure he'll tell you all about that today. Thank you for coming. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, So as um, Mary said, my name is Stephen Schuler. I'm in the Department of Preventive Medicine at Northwestern University, and I'm trained as a clinical psychologist. Uh, And a lot of the work that I do right now lays at the intersection of sort of three fields, uh, clinical psychology, um, uh, design and human-computer interaction, and implementation science. And so one of the questions that really drives me now is there's been a lot of evidence that shows that um, uh, technology-based mental health can be useful, um, but it really hasn't caught on despite this rampant enthusiasm for developing these sorts of things. And so really I think that we as a field need to consider how can we make sure that the stuff that we develop actually gets used in places where it can be helpful for people. So I'm going to go through some examples of some of the work that I'm doing um, that kind of spans different ways of thinking about how to get technologies out there, how to evaluate technologies, how to build technologies for diverse groups, um, and conclude with some thoughts about you know, the, the future of sort of um, mobile mental health. Um, So, again, I'm a clinical psychologist, I imagine, and I know most of the people here at Microsoft are not clinical psychologists, and so I want to talk a little bit about the scope of the problem, but then also how I think more um, about sort of mental health um, as as it applies more broadly. So, um, I work mostly in the area of uh, depression. Depression is a very wide um, spread problem. So, uh, depression is actually the largest contributor to uh, disability. Uh, Approximately one in five um, folks in the United States will experience a mental health disorder. Um, So by that I mean a clinically diagnosable version of a mental health um, condition. So depression and anxiety are the most common, um, but you know also more serious mental illness like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. These things are you know just extremely prevalent. Um, It's not you know you know, one in five does, means it's not like someone you know somewhere in your social network has a mental disorder. This means that, you know, the people that you interact with on a daily basis, the people who are intimately involved in your life experience mental health um, issues. The other thing I want to kind of point out in uh, this figure over here is that, you know, mental health is not just about presence or absence of disorders, but it's also a continuum of functioning. So I think this is sort of a good um, representation that, you know, we think, usually when we think about sort of mental health disorders, we think about, you know, disorders versus everything else. But everyone experiences times in their life where they experience some degree of mental health challenge. What this uh, kind of yellow box here is reacting. Um, so reacting means like something's going on in your life. I actually, I have uh, two-year-old triplets. Um, I can tell you that when those kids were born, um, it was a very stressful time. My mental health was not the best state at that time. That didn't mean I had a mental health disorder. That meant, you know, I was experiencing a time in my life that was stressful. Wasn't sleeping as well, you know, wasn't eating as well, wasn't being as active, you know, all these things that kind of promote mental health. And so that's also something that um, we need to address as mental health professionals and as folks who are interested in promoting mental health, to acknowledge that, uh, the stressors that come up in our lives and how we react to those are also things that we can develop um, tools and resources to help people with. Um, so it's not just, am I healthy or am I, you know, do I have a mental disorder, but all these sort of steps along that line. Um, so I have this uh, quote here from uh, the former um, U.S. Surgeon General, um, there's no health without mental health. And what I often say is it's not just one in five you know, Americans have a mental health disorder. 100% of Americans have to deal with mental health. This is something that we should be thinking about. Um, this, on the other hand, is a very depressing um, figure for me. Um, so what this figure shows is the representation of licensed uh, psychologists. Um, this is only psychologists, but if I showed you any other sort of figure that was a representation of mental health professionals, it would look about the same. Um, so there's about 196,000 uh, licensed clinical psychologists in the U.S. Uh, 33% of U.S. counties have not one single 
licensed mental health professionals. So in the red, you see places where there's a very high concentration of mental health professionals. So if you live on the coast, either coasts, if you live in kind of Chicago area, you can probably find a clinical psychologist. If you live anywhere else, you're going to be in trouble. And if you live in sort of this big stretch of the country here, that's where we have a you know, real sort of dearth of um, professionals. So there's lots of places where you don't have the choice to even get professional um, mental health services if you want them. And so this is a big problem that I think technology has a potential to kind of overcome. So, um, of course, there's an app for everything. Um, we know this. And there's been rapid development of um, mental health apps. Uh, so this is kind of based off a report from um, the IMS uh, Institute that came out in 2015. Um, I mean, I know that's a little uh, outdated now. I'll say that when they did the same report in um, uh, 2013, they estimated there were about 100,000 mental health apps. So from 2013 to 2015, it jumped by nearly 50, uh, a little bit more than 50%. Um, so they estimated in 2015 that there were roughly um, 165,000 health apps that are out there. Um, there's a more recent report from a different institute I saw that um, estimated about 250,000, um, which would be keeping up with about the rate of development that we've seen there. Um, about roughly 12,000 of those are focused towards mental health. That's a ton of stuff that's out there. Um, we don't know, you know how good all these things are. We don't know how helpful they are. But there's a lot of different things out there that are purported to be able to help people for um, different mental health disorders. Um, here's just a little bit of um, review of looking at the scientific evidence behind those things. These come from um, two separate um, systematic reviews where uh, what the, the authors did in both of these papers is they looked at all the apps that were publicly available on the app stores focused on a particular problem. So, um, the top one focuses on depression. This lower one focuses on anxiety. Um, the findings are relatively similar in that, um, you know, for depression, they found 117 apps. For anxiety, they found 316. About 10% of those were consistent with evidence-based practices. And by that, I mean they went to the content of the applications. They looked what was in there. Um, and they saw, does this coincide with what someone would recommend people to do um, from sort of evidence-based psychological practices? It's about 10% of the time those apps were actually consistent. There were actually, um, in several reviews, we find that there's a lot of apps that even have maybe harmful content. Um, there's one that's cited uh, pretty regularly for uh, bipolar disorder, where it tells you if your um, moods are kind of um, getting more disruptive. You know, this mood swings that are very common in bipolar. You might try to help it by drinking more because that will, you know, depress your moods. And it's this this information is out there, and it's you know if it's you know, it's, uh, these apps are sort of useless at best sometimes and harmful at the worst. And so we really need a lot more um, uh, resources and efforts to try to be able to provide useful information to consumers about what mental health uh, uh, apps are out there, which ones might be useful, which ones might be good. Um, the sort of typical way we think about evaluating things in, um, uh, in medicine and clinical psychology is through sort of a gold standard randomized controlled trial. Um, you know, where we have random assignment to two different programs. Um, you would do a pretest, you do the program, you do a post test. This is really great, but unfortunately, to do sort of the size of trials that we typically think about in clinical psychology as um, what we would want in these gold standard measurements, this is an extremely slow process. And so um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't evaluate some things through randomized controlled trials, but I also think that in the, the context of uh, digital mental health, we have to think about. Um, other evaluation strategies that can supplement the information we gain from randomized controlled trials. Um, so, um, as Mary mentioned, um, uh, I am the executive director of a project called CyberGuide. Uh, the goal at CyberGuide is to identify, curate, and disseminate information about uh, mental health apps. Um, we're funded by uh, the One Mind Institute, which is a nonprofit that promotes mental health research. Um, and we try to provide, you know, unbiased information, kind of like the consumer reports of um, digital mental health. So what does the CyberGuide website look like? What sort of things do we provide for folks? Um, we try to organize different mental health apps around different um, disorder categories, um, ranging from um, mood disorders, things like depression, um, schizophrenia, um, serious mental illness, um, PTSD, and other anxiety disorders, and as well as sort of 
general wellness tools made to promote um, mental health um, sort of more um, generally. Um, we divide things up also by the type of strategy that they have. I'll say that um, most of the tools in the area of sort of depression and anxiety tend to be cognitive behavioral therapy based. Um, this is the strongest, uh, that, well, I should say, this is the treatment with the strongest evidence base in clinical psychology. This does not necessarily mean that it's the strongest treatment. Um, it means that it's the most easy, it's the most manualized treatment. So that I mean that um, we as clinical psychologists have kind of laid down, if you want to do cognitive behavioral therapy, this is how you do it. This is what your sessions could cover. These are the tools that you need. And so it's been um, subjected to the most of these randomized controlled trials. Um, so I'm not saying it's the only thing that works, but I'm saying that it's the thing with the most evidence that shows that it works. Um, we also have a lot of uh, symptom trackers. These are very popular, as I'll talk about later. A lot of mindfulness tools. Um, I'll say just as sort of a point of what people are interested in mobile mental health, um, on the CyberGuide website, besides our main page and our product guide, which obviously have the most views because that's where people kind of go through the site, the most popular piece of content on our site is the review we post of Headspace. Um, Headspace is an extremely popular mental health app. Um, it has, I think, an estimated um, 10 million people who've used it. Um, the founder of Headspace, his TED Talk has 7 million views. Like, people really, really like Headspace. Um, whether, again, that means it's the best mental health app out there, I think that's you know, debatable. I, I've personally, you know, I've used Headspace. It doesn't really capture you know, me, but I'm also not really a strong you know, meditator. Um, but it's one that's extremely popular with uh, people. Um, so, if you click on our product guide, um, you'll see a listing of different mental health apps. We list uh, three different ratings um, on our website right now. One is the CyberGuide rating, which is a measure of uh, credibility. Through the CyberGuide rating, we look at sort of the evidence base. Is there scientific evidence that suggests that this mental health app is useful? Um, is it created by a scientific team, or does it have scientific or clinical um, advisor support that would suggest that these are people who know how to create and design um, effective clinical interventions? Um, is it updated frequently? Um, that um, you know, uh, does it have support behind uh, the product? Is it coming from a nonprofit or um, is it coming from a um, for-profit organization? Um, the next thing we look at is using something called the Mobile App Rating Scale. Uh, this is a measure that was developed from folks um, out of the University of Queensland to evaluate um, health apps. Uh, it focuses a lot on like the usability and user experience. Um, so. It could be that there's an app that has very good credibility, but is very hard to use. Um, I think we see this a lot because oftentimes in scientific studies to get people to use apps or to get um, people to participate in the study, they're incentivized through um, financial incentives. There might be a lot of sort of education on how to use that app in that randomized controlled trial. So that means if people are really motivated to use this and they get a lot of sort of troubleshooting around it, they'll use it and they can benefit. But if you put it out there and um, you, know, you don't have that support, people might have a hard time using it. So I think that, again, uh, you kind of need both of these things to make a really useful application. I'm sure I'm preaching the choir here that you know, effectiveness, usefulness is not just does it work, but you know, can people use it? Um, but this is an important piece that's usually left out in a lot of the um, psychological discussion uh, from the clinical psychology background of these tools. And then lastly, we have expert reviews for some of these apps, which is we have an expert in the field who knows that content area. If it's a cognitive behavioral therapy app um, for depression, we might have a depression um, expert. If it's a mindfulness app, we might have a mindfulness expert. But they create more of a narrative for users about how you might use this app, how it might be able to benefit you. Um, so just a little bit of um, uh, discussion around what we've found from mental health apps um, through this um, uh, endeavor of rating them. Um, from CyberGuide ratings, we rate everything on a 14-point uh, uh, scale and then present everything as a percentage. So um, apps can range from 0 to 100, hypothetically. Our actual range is 14 to 93 percent, um, with an average of 52 uh, percent. So uh, you know, there's some apps that look really credible out there. There's some apps that look really bad. Um, at CyberGuide, we try to um, not just rate the good apps, um, because we feel if someone finds an app, um, we want them to know, you know, if they find uh, Brain HQ, we want them to know, like, is this a good app? Is this not a good app? And so we really um, try to shy away from a strategy of identifying and recommending specific apps. Our goal is really to put the information out there in a useful way for consumers. Um, 
So uh, you can see from the percentiles that um, it does look like a lot of the apps do pretty well on this credibility rating. Um, well, a lot of apps, I should say, cluster around the center in terms of credibility rating. So there's not a lot at this high end. There's not a lot at this low end. There's a lot of apps that, you know, there's some, it might be useful. We don't really know. Um, uh, for the Mars ratings, 60% uh, of our products have these Mars ratings. Um, every product listed has a CyberGuide rating. Um, the range here, again, is 1.63 to 4.75 with an uh, uh, average of 3.5. So things do okay on this um, user rating scale. Um, again, the uh, interquartile range that shows that a lot of stuff kind of clusters in the middle there. Um, I'll say that these credibility and these Mars rating scales are almost um, uh, not correlated at all. So the correlation between these things are about uh, an R of 0.2. And I say, like, not correlated at all because Practically anything you correlate in psychology will get an R of like 0.2. Like, it just happens. Like, things are somewhat correlated. Um, they also don't correlate very highly with the um, uh, ratings off of the um, public app stores. Um, neither the Mars rating nor the um, CyberGuide rating. So it seems like if we just look at the um, the user ratings of scores, um, that that's not really representing either the credibility or the user experience of an app. So it's hard to say then from a user's perspective when they go and rate these applications on um, app stores what they're actually looking at. I'm um, also saying in terms of public-facing app store ratings, um, so things off of the Google Play Store and the Apple iTunes Store, uh, there's a lot of these applications that are very popular in either the clinical literature or the popular literature that have uh, no um, public sort of rating of... Um, uh, on the app stores because they don't have enough ratings. That um, at least on the iTunes store, you need a couple, you need a certain number of ratings before it'll actually display the average. Uh, and usually, most of these mental health apps um, don't have them. I think about 10% of the apps that we've uh, looked at actually have um, publicly available uh, ratings on the app stores. Um, in terms of uh, the expert reviews, um, about 30% of our products have expert reviews. Um, and we, uh, so the expert reviews do look at the higher range of the product. So we have an average CyberGuide rating of 60 and an average Mars rating of 3.79. So again, we try to focus on the upper range of products there. We don't really feel like we need to provide consumers with a lot of information about how to use the products that we don't seem uh, to be all that good. We really want to direct people to things that we think might be more useful. Uh, so one of the things actually we'd like to do more in the future um, with CyberGuide is we want to look more also at integrating the user experience um, of their uh, impression of these applications. As I said, the, uh, the public um, uh, consumer marketplaces of app stores, that those ratings don't really relate to the information that we're gathering. And so we'd like to gain more understanding of you know, what it is that people like and don't like about applications and how we can present that back to them. So that's one thing that we, we're really kind of focusing on now is how do we engage uh, the consumers as stakeholders in terms of contrib contributing information that we can then disseminate. I think this is a really big need for um, mental, uh, digital mental health more generally is engaging stakeholders more in the process of both the development um, and the evaluation piece of this. The FDA does not currently regulate any of these mental health apps. The FDA only regulates health apps if they um, are, are used for the purposes of assessment of providing an intervention. So if, um, you were, if you developed an app that was meant to sort of diagnose you for a mental disorder and then provide that information to your clinician, it would be arguable that that would be, um, you know, should be regulated by the FDA. Uh, these apps are really sold as sort of do-it-yourself or self-management tools, and so they don't fall under the FDA regulation. Um, there is one app I know that was on track for FDA approval, um, and that was an app that was created by Pair Therapeutics um, that was made to be used in the context of substance use. Um, but that was one, again, that helped diagnose people and then um, provided that information to their provider. So it really has to be, to be under the current sort of FDA um, purview of what they've said they're going to regulate in digital health space, it needs to be used um, in the context of uh, treatment. So, so the mental health is similar then to the fitness, the fitness apps that are out there as well? Exactly. Yep. Okay. yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Is there any way of recording adverse events? So does anybody track these? You know, no. Um, not in sort of the public space. I think that's, and that's one thing I think is also really important is where the, like this bipolar app I mentioned that, you know, has this very sort of, um, 
uh, potentially dangerous uh, recommendation in there. And I think, again, it's a, right now it's a very sort of wild west. Um, and that would be a good you know, thing to kind of um, get is like collecting more information about when these apps do go you know, seriously wrong. I apologize if I'm mistaken. I believe that APA also has an app reading system. You, by APA, do you mean the American Psychological yeah. Association or the American Psychiatric Association? Shoot, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, the American Psychiatric Association does have an app um, rating system. It follows a lot of the same kind of guidelines of what we do in CyberGuide. Um, it's meant more to be a consumer framework. So um, what the um, American Psychiatric Association has done is it sets up sort of a tiered system of if you're a consumer and you want to look at a mental health app, um, these are the things you sh could, should consider. Privacy and security, effectiveness, user experience, interoperability. Um, I think that's really great, but I think as a consumer, I would have, a, like, if you told me about, you know, if I went to go buy a car and you told me, like, these are the things you should consider when you're buying a car. Um, safety, uh, gas mileage, you know, all these things. You can tell me to evaluate those things, but I'm not going to know how to do it. And so I think that's a little bit of um, where I think that the American Psychiatric Association framework does a really nice job of like saying what we should look at. But I think that consumers often need that sort of extra step to get there. Definitely. Did you use it as kind of a guide? Before you a a lot of the sort of areas that we cover um, overlap with the American Psychiatric Association, with the um, exception of the privacy security section. Um, that's something we're debating a lot internally. Um, it's sort of a, uh, so there was an org, a group that tried to evaluate health apps more generally, um, known uh, as Haptic. And Haptic got in big trouble um, because they had a model where they would do individual sort of um, certification of apps, um, kind of like you would want the FDA to do perhaps. Um, and they got into hot water when there are a couple apps that they sort of signed off on. It was shown that they were actually selling um, users' data to third parties. And so, I think that's one of the problems um, that you run into with this privacy and security is that you, it's hard to know sometimes with these apps where the data actually is going, what people are doing with data, and some um, organizations are not so clear with that. Uh, and so again, um, it's hard to provide sort of a recommendation of like this is a secure app if you don't have all the information from it yourself. If I'm in the app store and I'm looking for an anxiety app, how would I even know that CyberGuide existed? That's a great question. I think that that's um, one thing that we are trying to do is partner with organizations. Um, we have an agreement with Mental Health America to partner with um, their screening um, uh, exercise uh, where people get screened through Mental Health America and then um, get, uh, recomm uh, can get recommendations for different services. Um, you know. Right now, there's no way of knowing that. And I think without teaming with those app stores themselves, um, that's going to be a problem that um, is not going to be um, able to be overcome. Um, so I want to transition to um, a little bit more research around um, how and why people use mental health apps. Um, this is a, a Penny Arcade comic that I really like that makes me think about this um, from years ago, where apps were really just blowing up and the two characters are fighting about whether one should buy a console game or app games. And uh, I love this quote here. like. Well, you buy one 3DS game, a Nintendo game, and I'll buy 40 games on my phone and we'll see who has more fun. Um, so sort of this idea of like, yeah, you can support $40 on one game or I can spend $40 on 40 different games and we'll see who actually gets more enjoyment out of this, kind of arguing for this model of diversity um, in terms of um, products. So um, one of the things that we did uh, recently um, is we looked at users who were entering into um, or are interested in entering into different clinical trials that we were doing at the Center for Behavioral Intervention Technologies. And before they got onboarded into any of our trials, we actually just simply asked them, you know, what sort of health apps do you have on your phone? What sort of m mental health apps do you have on your phone? Why do you use these apps? Um, what are the app names? And we found that um, most people used mental health, uh, multiple apps. Um, the average was two. There was a range from zero to 20. Um, so again, this isn't suggesting that people are finding one health app and they're using it. They're using this, you know, this Penny Arcade um, uh, sort of model of you know, trying a bunch of different things and seeing what's helpful for them. Um, about one fourth of them were mental health or wellness apps, which um, corresponds um, you know, somewhat with the sort of overall representation. Um, again, probably this number is a bit elevated from the um, uh, general population because these are all people who are entering into a clinical trial um, that was focused on mental health. 92.8% um, were free. Um, and it's worth knowing that this is not representative of the um, overall sort of marketplace of mental health apps. So 
people are disproportionately focused on downloading free apps um, uh, for their health, which uh, I think is really interesting. And also, you know, again, not representative if you just look at the sort of um, the marketplace review of what's out there. Uh, in, in our data, we found if we looked at the purposes for the applications, the most common reason people said they were using mental health applications was for tracking purposes. Um, uh, about 40% of the apps that people um, uh, were using, they said they were using for some sort of tracking purpose. What was really interesting to me, actually, was that when we looked at the names of the different apps that people were using, there was not a, a large proportion, but there was a proportion of um, apps that they noted that were not mental health apps, they were not health apps at all. Um, they were things like Snapchat, like uh, Google Documents, like Facebook, like Twitter. And people actually reported using these different things for um, health purposes. And so I think that's another sort of interesting piece to this puzzle here that as um, you know, clinical psychologists, we often look at the app store, we look at things that you know, people search for anxiety, people search for depression, and those are the things we're kind of evaluating. But there's a lot of way that people might be using non-health apps for health purposes. And I think that we as a field should better understand when that's going on what people are getting out of that and how we can actually maybe build some of these tools to better meet the mental health needs that people are um, having when they're going to these different things. Um, so I want to kind of loop back to that um, IMS report because I think it actually has some interesting points to make about what uh, the apps actually do in terms of functionality. Um, so if back in 2015 when the IMS looked at all the different health apps that are available, um, they noticed that about half the apps had a single functionality, so that means that most of the apps do one thing, um, and that most of the time that functionality was to inform people. So effectively, most health apps that are out there are psychoeducational tools that um, teach people things. They're self-help books that have been made into an app format. Um, self-help books are great. We've had them for years. They can be useful for people, but I think what's going on here is a, um, a sad um, opportunity um, uh, a lost opportunity, I should say, to use the true sort of affordances of digital technologies um, to do really sort of creative things um, in the health space. Um, there's, I think it was about 5% uh, here of apps that were used for communication purposes. So the ability to connect people either to each other, um, and that was actually what was most common is that so of that small percentage of apps that have communication purposes, most of the time those apps are allowing people to connect to social media. Um, maybe that's the best thing for health apps to do, maybe it's not. I'm not gonna you know, open up the debate here, but I'm just saying like that's the most common uh, communication purpose is let's share our, our health information to social media. Um, uh, 34 were to social networks, again, sort of a social you know, component to that. 2% um, were to providers. So very few health apps actually have any sort of information of interoperability that allows information to be translated from a user to a provider. Um, again, I think this is a big missed opportunity. Um, I was talking with Mary a little bit about this um, earlier, um, about how we actually can take information from different uh, health apps and be able to share that with providers. And I think we need a lot more understanding of what providers want in those circumstances, what um, uh, patients want in those circumstances, and how to best sort of translate patient needs um, and wants to provider needs and wants. So I want to, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was curious if that 2% for uh, provider communication, is that related to just not right, building that in functionality into the app to begin with because they don't want to, or is it because of EHR barrier integration, integration barriers? Uh, that, that's a good question. I think it's probably a little bit of both. Okay. Um, I mean, getting information to the EHR uh, is a huge headache. I know at Northwestern, we're, we're just starting this new initiative called, um, uh, oh man, it's like, Project One or something like that, where they're trying to bring all of the instances of Epic to have one version where they'll all communicate with each other. And in the process of doing that, they've completely locked down um, uh, introduction of new information to the EHR. So we can't put any information. It's just whenever I do projects, that is a non-starter. No information gets to go into the EHR. I've seen some workarounds where it's like information can be translated into a document that can be uploaded as a attachment to a provider um, you know, message. Um, but direct integration to the EHR has been a major headache for any project that I've worked on. So I imagine that's you know, a big barrier for a lot of other people too. And up here, JMIR um, study, I don't know if you've asked, asked this question or not. Um, did you ask or kind of find anything in the, in the literature about how people find out about the health apps that they use? Is it you know, we didn't. 
look in that specific study where we have a current study where we're doing where we're trying to ask that question to find more like you know wh where do you come to health apps um, and also what we're really interested in the current study we're doing is when they look for them, what information would be most valuable to them to kind of direct their decision? I think that's, you know, it's a big open question. I, yeah, I think it's worth looking to. So on the 2% of information that does yeah. this, you communicate to providers, can the providers actually do anything with that information? Or is it still, like you said, that's where you have to I, I, uh, both sides and commonize that, it? That's a, a tricky question. Maybe, um, can I come back to that at the end of the talk? Because yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, there might be a little bit more discussion to have around that. But that, that's a really good and tricky question. Um, so I want to actually go into uh, another platform that we've developed at Northwestern um, that we call uh, IntelliCare. And it takes a slightly different design perspective uh, to uh, mobile mental health. So what IntelliCare is, is instead of a single app, we developed an app suite that's um, organized by uh, this hub application. So the IntelliCare app suite actually has 12 different mini applications that each focus on a specific behavior change technique. Um, so here's a couple of them. This is actually one of our most popular apps. It's called Daily Feats. Um, when you sign up for the app, you take a brief sort of depression anxiety screener. Um, I'll say IntelliCare it was intentionally designed to deal with um, issues of depression anxiety. So you take a depression anxiety um, screener. It gives you a set of tasks to do each day, a daily, you know, daily feats. They're organized around your level of depression anxiety. Um, so if, you're, if you are pretty depressed when you start out, you'll have just very basic feats. Um, get out of bed, groom yourself, make good food choices, go outside. I will say these might seem very basic to you, but one of the, thing, the feedback we've gotten from our users is that it's extremely empowering for them when they're um, seriously depressed for us to kind of reframe these things that they truly struggle with as feats to be accomplished. Um, so you open up the application, you check off which things you do that day, um, if you form a streak over multiple days, you get a little indication in terms of, you know, uh, green um, uh, numbers. Um, you uh, have enough streaks over subsequent days. You move up to um, subsequent levels. And you continue to keep leveling up, get more and more challenging things. Um, very simple application, very easy to use, very, very popular in our suite. Um, this is not uh, five days of completing a goal. Um, this is an app that I developed. Um, it's called My Mantra. Um, I call it the Pinterest of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, you collect sort of pictures that organize around a positive self-affirming mantra. Um, there's a couple example ones in here in the, um, uh, the application. Things like I'm strong, I'm grateful, um, I'm resilient. Uh, and as you collect these, uh, you know, these photos, you get them fed back to you through notifications. Again, very, very simple, um, a popular app within our suite. Um, this is Thought Challenger. It's maybe the most kind of classic um, mental health app that's in uh, the IntelliCare suite. Um, it helps walk you through the process of cognitive restructuring, which is uh, this idea that um, the, the content of your thoughts is more important than the actual situation. It helps you come up with more sort of positive ways to view situations. Um, so uh, you come up with a negative, unrealistic thought. You substitute it with a more realistic way of thinking. This walks you through the step, five-step process of doing that. And on the home screen, you have all of the kind of good, positive, reframe thoughts, um, a word cloud that's generated from that content. We want to throw the positive content back at people as opposed to the negative content. Um, so we uh, did an um, uh, eight-week field trial of the IntelliCare platform. Um, I will say that it was done along with uh, sort of coached support. We had a person um, providing some light sort of encouragement engagement through text messaging. Um, this is the result from that um, single arm field trial. We found that people over eight weeks um, experienced uh, significant reductions in uh, their levels of depression as well as anxiety. We just recently wrapped up a 300-person uh, um, four-armed randomized controlled trial of IntelliCare, so we'll have more data on this soon. Um, uh, this again shows, you know, similar thing, but looks at the uh, percent of people who are in full remission or um, partial, or sorry, full remission or recovery, which is indicated by um, sort of uh, clinically set cut points um, in terms of reductions on those same scales. So people reduced in their depression and anxiety. Uh, this was actually one of the more exciting um, findings uh, to me which is that the use of IntelliCare was um, pretty consistent over that eight-week period. Um, so we had uh, an average launch of about uh, 25 sessions per week um, and an um, average time of one minute per session. So people really were going to these apps multiple times per day, using them in very short bursts. 
um, and that that use was sustained over this eight-week period. In most mental health apps, you see a pattern where people might use it for a week or two, and then it drops off dramatically. Um, uh, they call this the law of attrition in uh, um, digital uh, health research, that uh, it's pretty inevitable that people will stop using these things over time. So at least this was sort of good evidence that um, in this, again, it's a coached trial, so there is a human supporter there. Um, this isn't people who are just using things on their own. Um, we've done some evaluations of uncoached, um, and it's not you know, as good as this, but it still looks fairly good in the IntelliCare um, suite. Um, so this is just another thing about um, treatment engagement. Um, the thing I think I want to point out here is that the average time that people, uh, that the coaches used was 39 minutes over those eight weeks. So again, this is a very sort of lean protocol that these coaches are doing. This is not, you know, full sort of therapy that's done through text messaging. It's, you know, uh, about three text messages per week um, uh, that are sent to the user to sort of encourage them to continue to use the platform. Yeah. Emails so there's some notifications through the um, the apps. Um, it's organized by um, we have a, a hub app that actually uh, um, provides messaging, and so all those notifications hit the, the the central hub. So they're all kind of contained within the app. Um, another thing, actually, um, within that hub app is one thing that we're really interested in is if we can use this IntelliCare platform as a recommendation engine. Um, and so uh, one of the arms in that, um, so I'll say that forearm field trial is a two by two design. Um, so we compared uh, coaching versus no coaching. And we compared a, um, a full IntelliCare Hub app that had notifications and um, recommendations. So every week you would get a new recommendation that says this week try out these two IntelliCare apps for you um, versus an IntelliCare app, um, a Hub app that um, just had the, uh, the sort of available IntelliCare apps within that hub. So no notifications and no um, recommendations. Um, so one of the things that we're really interested in is, can we actually take these apps and then figure out which you know, app should a person use in the next week? So this is just a little representation of what that um, IntelliCare hub looks like. This is the, uh, the non-recommending version of the hub app. So um, in the recommending version, you'll have a little box here that will say, these are the two apps you should use this week. Um, so right now, it looks like initial data is suggesting that we're actually able to um, increase uh, use of the applications through these recommendations, and that um, this specific recommendation, that the recommendation uh, engine um, is, that we're using is actually improving on a naive recommender that's just do, giving random recommendations. So it does seem like we're able to do a little bit of this recommendation, but I think this is something where we have a lot of kind of room to improve in our platform. Um, one other question on this. Yeah. When are recommending them in the study, are you, I mean, obviously you're recommending prescribing them to use this. Yeah. And that other arm, when you just gave them coached or non-coached, did they get to choose? Did, were there any choice them yeah. with using yeah. them? Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, even in the recommended one, they could use other apps, too. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's not that those are the only ones available to them. We're just pushing them towards particular ones. Okay. Um, and we do, um, these apps are all freely available on the Google Play Store. Um, a couple of them are on iOS. We've either got, I think we've got three to five that are on iOS already. I know um, the development is kind of rolling out for all of the iOS ones. Um, we do find that people from the public store who download the hub tend to download more applications than people who don't download the hub too. So this hub points people to things that they wouldn't be finding otherwise, um, just looking at IntelliCare apps sort of generally from the, the Play Store. Is there any like, uh, support from healthcare provider and recommending or? Kind of influencing so we health. have not tested it within a healthcare system yet. That's um, uh, a project we have on the horizon is actually doing this in healthcare settings where your providers or a member of your provider team would be, you know, that supporter. So far, our supporters have the, we start out with clinical psychologists from our group. We moved to research assistants because, as I said, we're not doing very fancy stuff um, with uh, the recommendations here. And um, I mean, one thing we're also really interested in is if we could automate some of those recommendations through using um, natural language processing, because at least our reports from the, the people doing the support is that it's not, what they're doing is not stuff that would, is all that challenging. But yeah, I think these are a lot of open questions we have with how we might be able to use this platform. Um, so I want to move on to another sort of um, a pilot study that um, we've been working on in Chicago um, uh, aimed at uh, providing mental health resources uh, to homeless youth. Um, so 
uh, about every, uh, every year, about 2 million um, uh, folks ages kind of 18 through 24 will spend a night homeless. Um, and uh, the rates of um, mental health disorders and um, homeless individuals are about two to three times higher than the general population. At the same time, only about 10% of those uh, folks get any sort of access to mental health resources. So we have a population, a highly vulnerable population, huge sort of um, uh, need for mental health services, very little sort of availability. Um, so what we've uh, done in Chicago is we launched a project that we call Stepping Stone. Um, Stepping Stone has a couple different components. Um, first, every youth who signs up for our study, we give them a smartphone device that's theirs to keep, and we pay for six months of their data service. Um, it's just, it's one thing that we've been, uh, we feel very strongly is that, um, you know, keeping them connected to um, having technology as a resource is, you know, very beneficial for them. Um, this has been an interesting challenge. Um, uh, we've learned a lot of sort of interesting things around, um, so we give them a data plan of five gigabytes. Um, uh, they get throttled if they go above that. Um, we had one period where our provider was switching over uh, carriers and they, that throttling was turned off and we had a youth that used 120 gigabytes of data in one week. Um, it was crazy. Uh, I mean, they, you know, they're, they're never on Wi-Fi, they're using this as their entertainment, as their communication, as everything. Um, it's, it's been a very interesting learning experience. Um, in addition, we put uh, three applications on their phone. We used two of those in telecare apps, one focused on meditation mindfulness called Purple Chill, another one focused on sleep, hyg uh, sleep hygiene called um, Slumber Time. We have a daily survey app on their, on their phone called Pocket Helper. Um, it sends uh, a survey that asks them about what their biggest challenge was that day, what's their stress level like, um, what was their sleep quality like, and it feeds that information back to a therapist on our team. Um, that therapist, they set up three 30-minute phone calls um, uh, that focus around kind of general coping skills. They also have the opportunity to text message that therapist at times outside of those phone calls. That's one reason why we're collecting this daily survey information so that if they text or call the therapist kind of outside of those scheduled sessions, that the therapist knows a little bit more about what's going on in their life. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's what the, the project consists of. Um, this is what sort of that daily survey um, looks like. Um, it gives them a, a coping uh, kind of tip every day that they rate on a five-point scale. Um, it feeds back their survey data to them, um, and we ask them kind of those brief questions. Uh, so this is sort of the general model. We have a, a back-end dashboard that provides that information to the clinician. Uh, the clinician gets that information, um, and they're able to intervene if something comes up um, to send kind of text message support um, in the moment. Um, or as close to the moment as possible, um, and the, the youth are able to text back to our therapist. Um, so we've run this project now with about, I think we have now about 40 people who've been recruited. Um, uh, most people really like the study. Um, they like the tips the best. They like the apps the least. Um, this is something that's been really interesting to us because the tips are really easy for us to develop. The apps are very expensive and hard. Um, and so it makes me wonder sometimes, like, why are we building apps? Why don't we just send tips to people? Um, it's a good question. Um, most people would recommend the study for other people. Um, we haven't looked at the clinical outcomes yet, um, uh, but uh, we've had sort of encouraging results from the engagement. Um, actually, initially, our engagement looked really bimodal. Um, people would either engage in everything, they would complete all their sessions, they would text message regularly, um, or they would kind of disappear completely. Um, we've actually recently sort of had um, one more sort of bucket of engagement. So we have the people who don't engage at all. We have the people who complete all of their phone sessions and text message regularly. And now we have a group of folks who um, aren't completing any of the phone sessions, but they're texting regularly with um, the therapist. So it seems like, you know, there's different ways to engage people in these platforms. And I think that that's an important thing to remember is like, what is the expected use? And also, what are patterns of engagement that might be interesting and useful for the person doing it? Um, because I think a lot of time when we look at digital mental health, people think about adherence. Um, they use that word a lot, and I, I'm a little skittish with the word adherence because adherence kind of suggests to me that there's one way of interacting. It's like we have a medication, you're supposed to use it three times a day, and like I don't know if digital mental health is the same sort of way, so I really like to think about this as sort of engagement or usage. Um, but there's different ways that people might engage with the platform, and that doesn't mean that one way is you know, necessarily the best way or you know, we should preference one style of engagement um, besides the other, I think we need to learn more about what styles of engagement are useful for different folks. Why did they like the apps the least? 
You know, I think one of the reasons is that it's not, they weren't well integrated into the program that we had. Um, I also think that um, the, the sleep app we put on there, because that was one of our sort of first goals for this project, was to work with sleep hygiene. And um, the kids are actually not all that interested in sleep hygiene. There's a lot of other things that they have going on. Um, I think their problems with depression and anxiety are also slightly different than the general population. So um, there's a lot of sort of emotional regulation and interpersonal issues that come up. Those are the um, main content that kind of came up in the text messages and the phone sessions. And we don't have apps that kind of specifically address those things. And so even though the sort of treatment, like cognitive behavioral therapy would still be a treatment strategy that would be useful, we might need to develop apps that kind of focus on the specific content areas that would be interesting to this group. So I think, you know, tailoring for a particular population is sort of really, um, you know, key and critical. Yeah, one last thing on that. I was just curious about what apps you decided, how do you went about deciding what apps you might put on? Um, so uh, one was because our funder was funding us to do sort of sleep stuff, and so we had put the sleep app on there. We're always tied a little bit by, you know, where our money's coming from. And then the, the mindfulness app um, we put on there because it reinforced a lot of the coping skills that we were teaching in, our, um, uh, in those phone sessions. I think, uh, I mean, that's actually something we're, we're moving to a phase two project here. And in the phase two project, we're putting more diversity of apps on there um, because, you know, we have the apps available to us in the healthcare suite. Um, it might make sense just to give them all to them and see which ones they use. Um, so here's actually, uh, I want to conclude real fast with a kind of conceptual thing that um, I talk a lot about in my work um, that I think uh, I want to frame a little bit differently here because, uh, you know, being here at Microsoft, I know that this might be a term that some people are familiar with, and I use it slightly differently than it's used commonly in the literature. So um, the term skeuomorphism uh, is a term that's used a lot in, like, UI UX design um, to talk about visual elements um, that exist in uh, digital technologies that are sort of remnants of uh, the past physical uh, examples of that. So... Um, you know, I use uh, this example here of uh, light bulbs uh, that look like candle flames because that's what candles look like in the past. Those things could be anything. They could be dinosaurs. They could be hockey pucks, but we decided to make them candles uh, to look like fire. Um, this is a you know, great example I got from a presentation where someone says, I showed my 12-year-old son an old floppy disk, and he said, wow, cool, you 3D printed the save icon. No, that's the opposite way that works. We made a save icon that represented the way that we used to save things. Um, so... Uh, I think that often in digital mental health, we actually engage in conceptual skeuomorphisms, where we take concepts from face-to-face -face therapy and we translate them to digital technologies. So we make uh, web-based cognitive behavioral therapy programs where we expect people to come back on a weekly basis and spend you know, 50 minutes going through content because that's what psychotherapy is like when that's not the way that most people use digital technology and that maybe is not the way that would be most helpful to them. Um, so effectively, we are trying to fit, you know, our old model of psychological practice into these digital mediums. And I think instead what we should be doing as we think about digital mental health is sort of reimagining um, how we can actually take the unique affordances of technologies to build uh, um, new products, new designs that actually leverage what we know about behavior change and mental health strategies, but do so in sort of the new medium of technology. Um, so here's actually a project that I did with uh, Lana Yurosh from University of Minnesota where we were sort of very interested in this stakeholder-engaged perspective around happiness technologies. So we did a, um, uh, a, a six-week, um, uh, sorry, yeah, six-week um, uh, cooperative inquiry sort of co-design workshop with uh, kids around uh, happiness technologies. Uh, so this was a true sort of interdisciplinary project. Um, I came in as the clinical psychologist with a background in positive psychology. We spent the first couple weeks of the workshop teaching kids about the inventing process and also teaching them positive psychology skills. So I did what you know, I would typically do as a psychologist if I was running just a psychology workshop. And then we transitioned to, okay, now that we've empowered you with the concepts and the knowledge of positive psychology, we taught you about gratitude, we taught you about mindfulness, we taught you about sort of problem solving from a, a cognitive perspective, um, what sort of technologies would you guys build um, that would able, uh, be able to promote well-being? And they came up with some really sort of interesting examples. Um, this is my favorite one here. This is the mindfulness backpack. Um, it had a little um, uh, sort of distraction machine on the back to be able to take people out of whatever moment they're in. 
Um, it also had a good smell generator, and uh, the kind of good smells these kids came up with were chocolate chip cookies and uh, the smell of their own bed. Um, just really sort of cool, creative things. Um, they also came up with things that were very similar to some things that have been designed. Um, so this was their um, a sort of thought tank. Um, it used fish, which I think is kind of funny because uh, I've seen a lot of sort of designs um, from different folks where they use animals or fish as kind of representations of um, mental sort of health processes in sort of uh, visual displays for applications. But this one is kind of coming up with a, um, a positive cognitive reframe. So the fish here is saying, I'm smart. Um, kind of counteracting some, uh, some negative thoughts that they had. Um, but it was really sort of interesting, engaging, um, and useful to engage with this process with the kids. Um, another thing I thought that was really interesting was um, looking at the engagement strategy they came up with, with how would you want to entice kids to stay engaged with these different technologies? Um, we definitely saw the sort of typical engagement strategies that come up in what um, a lot of people design. You know, games, gamification, health is huge, although I, I have a separate rant I'll tell you in another time about my theories on gamification. Uh, social support is big. Um, but actually, one of the th some of the things I thought were really interesting were um, responding directly to emotions or thoughts, making these things more tangible for people. Um, it was also really interesting, um, if we went go back to this example here, you can see that most of the things that the kids came up with were some form of embodied um, technology, wearables, backpacks, robots, um, watches, like they really wanted something they could touch and feel. Um, if you look at the sort of digital mental health space, most of the stuff is software. We have very few sort of wearable, tangible technologies that are trying to promote mental health, um, especially in kids. Um, I think this is a, a space that really would be interesting to develop. Um, so I think that teaming with kids gave us some interesting ideas about um, what are different things that um, people would be interested in. I think more of this sort of co-design process needs to be done in digital mental health. Again, I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here, but I think you know, coming from a clinical psychology background, this is typically not what clinicians do when they develop sort of new um, mental health technologies. A device that slaps you if you're not being grateful. <laughs> yeah. There was also sort of this, uh, I, I actually thought this, this was a theme that was really sort of interesting with the kids is that um, there was this interesting sort of balance between the positive and the negative um, in that they, they wanted things that sort of identified the negative experiences that they were going through and had some ways to try to Im incorporate the positive aspect. And so... That, that's a really sort of interesting dichotomy that doesn't show up in sort of more broad sort of discussion of positive psychology. So again, some of these ideas are sort of off the wall. Um, I will say that at least in the iteration process, I think that something that was sort of unique about the way that we did this is we did this sort of long-term workshop. Um, there were 14 sessions we did with the same kids. They came back. They learned more about the inventing process. Um, the amount of ideas they generated sort of decreased over time. Um, and the quality of the ideas tended to get better throughout sessions. So definitely they learned along the way, you know, how to engage in this process with us. And I think most of the times, um, again, I'm not, I come from a clinical psychology background. I'm not a designer, even though I love this stuff. Um, but most of the people I see doing sort of this type of work in psychology tend to do a workshop with a group of kids and move on to another workshop with another group of kids. And I, I think there is this sort of, interesting aspect of trying to think better on how to team over the long term with the stakeholders that we're working with. Because I think that's a big part of the sort of mental health um, uh, journey is like re that it, we design a lot of these sort of singular experiences and or experiences that are meant to stay stable over time. And that's not the way therapy works. That's not the way life works. That's not the way mental health works. And I think we need to better think about also how we allow tools to be flexible to allow for a variety of different interactions. Um, so just a couple conclusions here. Um, there's lots of mental, mobile mental health options that are out there. They're actually being developed at a, at a break, breakneck pace. Um, you know, every single day it seems like there's some new app or new product or new something that someone's doing in digital mental health. Um, the diversity of mobile mental health um, options is somewhat limited, though. A lot of people tend to be building the same sort of things. I have seen so many cognitive behavioral therapy thought record apps. We built a cognitive ther uh, behavioral therapy sort of thought record app. Um, and the quality is unknown. And so I think that one of our goals um, right now should be to introduce some more variance, some more diversity into 
the products, the designs, the things we're evaluating, and use the information we have available to us to better understand which of these things work and which of these things don't. Um, and then again, to kind of go back to the theme I, I mentioned at the beginning, that this excitement, this enthusiasm for, enthusiasm for digital mental health has not been matched by implementation. Um, we see lots of things that are out there that have been developed. We've not seen a lot of things that have really caught on. Um, at least in the area of kind of depression and anxiety, um, there's been somewhere on the magnitude of 100 randomized controlled trials evaluating these things. There has not been one sort of successful implementation where these things have caught on and stayed around in a healthcare system. And I think that one of the big problems for that is um, these things have not been designed with implementation in mind um, and haven't really, we haven't really deeply thought about how these things can integrate into the healthcare systems that they're in. Um, these are just some examples of sort of recent uh, sort of uh, designs or um, um, different ver things in mobile mental health that have been rolled out there. And I think one thing that's been really interesting to me as an um, observer of this field is that we see more and more sort of work where um, we're seeing these things pop up in places where um, we, wouldn't, we don't think about these things as a mental health tool. So Facebook's efforts to try to do um, suicide identification or um, outreach, um, uh, the Google Calendar's feature to sort of recommend a goal in times where we have open spaces in our calendar. Um, this is behavioral activation. This is something we've been doing in, in clinical psychology for years and years and years. If you get people more active, if you get people more engaged in naturally reinforcing things, spending time with other people, being physically active, this will help your mental health. And so I think there's a lot of places where um, Clinical psychology ideas can be what could be um, well implemented and integrated into existing technologies if it's done thoughtfully and if it's done usefully. This kind of goes back to the theme I sort of mentioned with uh, the um, the paper we did reviewing different mental health or different health apps that people were using, where people identified uh, health uses for non-health apps. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, I just want to acknowledge um, many of the people who helped me do this work as well as um, some of my different um, funding organizations that have helped support this. Um, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions, but I do want to kind of come back to the question of sort of um, uh, integration into uh, to healthcare settings. Um, but thank you all for your attention. Sure, sure yeah. So, um, I think it's a really tricky thing. So, um, there's a project I've been working on right now where we're Try, we're de we developed a platform that's made to be used in the context of clinical behavioral therapy for depression. Sorry, clinical, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. And we did that through sort of um, user-centered design with both patients and providers. Um, and those groups have very different goals and very different sort of interests. And so I think um, we need better ways to bring the information that patients or people create um, into the clinical setting in ways that are usable to clinicians. And so uh, there's a project also, another project I'm working on where we're trying to use Fitbit data um, in an intensive outpatient program for um, veterans with PTSD um, to try to get information about activity levels, sleep levels that might be able to inform the treatment. Um, but I think what we really need to do know is what are sort of the treatment goals that providers have and how can this information, this data, be most useful for the things that they're accomplishing? So I think it's a, it's a design problem, but I think it's one that's um, surmountable. Sounds like a similar shape to that. I thought maybe you applied a little bit more advanced in like some cardiovascular health uh, uh, area because we've been talking to providers there too and a lot of information that, again, cardiovascular health is not usable to the yep. provider. But the patients find it very interesting, whether it's relevant or not, they still find it interesting. Yeah, I think so one thing, like one thing that thing. we've found in some of the settings is that it might be the case that we're going to have to create new professions of people who are going to be able to deal with that data. Because again, like the cardio, you know, vascular folks and like, you know, providers usually don't have a lot of time. Um, but if you could have another role sort of develop that could be a, sort of the information, you know, collector and, you know, um, presenter, like health that might be something. Sort of yeah. Sure, yeah, maybe a health coach, maybe something, something, yeah. To provide information. Yep. So I a physician we were talking to about Kurt Reskel said the same thing. If there is some way to take all this information, boil it down to something that's useful to a treatment plan that a physician can recommend, yep. then they have some use for the data. Otherwise, it becomes, you know, just noise to them. Yep, so it's exactly. Like yep. Well, you can look at WellDoc, right? Sorry? Uh, you can look at WellDoc, that one's prescribed by physicians or pharmacists. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's an interesting model about how it goes about. What was, what was it called? Well done. I don't know. Okay. Right, so why don't you like gamification? Right? It's just, <laughs> there, there's such a huge push. In so the I, I think yeah, gamification. So we did have points in there. So I think gamification has to be done 
very mindfully to not to for two uh, aspects. One that you know, if we're dealing with mental health, I, I think we want to make sure that we respect that. For off, for many people, this is a very serious, very challenging thing, and I don't think we want to necessarily transform this into a game for them. Um, I think the other sort of aspect, um, I, I borrow a, a phrase from uh, Ian Bogus that he talks about uh, chocolate-covered broccoli, is that we, uh, so we know chocolate's good, we know broccoli's good for us. Most of us are willing to tolerate broccoli because we know it's good for us, even if we don't love it. We love chocolate, but um, you, know, you don't want to put those two things together. And so I think gamification is that sometimes. It's like we know health is good for us, we know these things are good, we know games are fun and we like to do them, but you don't want to just spread the games all over the health stuff. Um, so I think that if you, one, sort of belittle a person's emotional experience in the context of mental disorders, and two, make it more about the extrinsic engagement in the gaming component as opposed to the intrinsic value that they get out of the um, activity, I think that's very challenging. On the same time, we know game mechanics, we know challenges, um, you know, that's a big part of sort of mental health. Um, I, I, you know, something I say all the time is that you know, one of the secrets to really getting people you know, hooked into the things that we do or get, you know, getting people moving in the right direction is uh, clear goals and immediate feedback. And that, you know, that's a game. Um, so I think that we can integrate gaming elements, but the, the term gamification like, scares me sometimes. So that's my gamification rant. Chocolate-covered broccoli. Yeah. I have a two-part question about uh, the cyber guide. Is, uh, how, do you, how do you choose which apps you want to evaluate? And second is... Uh, you mentioned that the scores are different for the, your cyber yep. ratings and the app store ratings. I was wondering, what is the correlation between those ratings? So I think the correlation there is about 0.15. I would have to look it up again. It's, it's pretty low. Um, and that, so I answered that first because it's the easier question to answer. In terms of prioritizing apps, we have sort of a multi-stage prioritization process. Um, we do a consistent review of the scientific literature, um, again, because we sort of one of the sort of th uh, aspects we're rating things on is credibility. We know that things are going to get higher credibility scores if they're in the scientific literature. Um, and so we try to sort of promote those. Um, we all then do sort of a prioritization based on um, uh, a popularity score that's a combination of the number of downloads and the reviews from the public stores, as well as sort of um, identification through um, uh, searches and other appearances in media sources. So if people are talking about it, we want to make sure that it's represented. Um, if there's an app that's up there that's not really being used, people aren't talking about it, like it's not as important for us to rate. Um, uh, especially if like we don't have good evidence that you know it has scientific support or sort of clinical content behind it. Um, uh, so those are sort of the main factors we use to sort of identify and to uh, um, propose them. We also get um, some sort of self-referrals um, through, you know, a developer has designed an application, they want it um, rated on CyberGuide. And so um, I think we get, you know, like, depending on the week, like five to ten people contacting us about, like, would you post my thing or um, uh, will, would you evaluate this thing that I've seen out there? Um, I think a lot of times we get things of people who've like created some sort of self-help site that has like just content on it, which is not the sort of stuff we review. And we also get a lot of um, requests from um, B to C, uh, B2B or B, B, uh, you know to business products. Um, so uh, platforms that are trying to sell to healthcare settings or to businesses to provide some sort of mental health support for their employees or the the folks that they cover. Um, we currently are not evaluating those because we're meant um, to be a more consumer-facing fa um, website. And then the other reason is that a lot of businesses and healthcare systems have the resources to evaluate things and usually have their own, own sort of evaluation criteria. And so we're really trying to provide a service for people who um, don't have the resources to evaluate things or, again, to kind of go back to the American Psychiatric Association framework, maybe don't know how to evaluate it themselves, even if they're given a little bit of a framework. So we're trying to create more information um, for the people who need it. I think we have time for one more question. We actually have a talk starting at 3, so we have to be out of the room by a quarter till. So one more, and then we'll... Great. I, we'll I do. No one else does. Right. So you mentioned that um, thought challenger. Mm -hmm. uh, you have very good results with engagement and usage. Yeah over your eight-week trial, and you said you didn't think that the coaching was... All of it, yeah. ...was responsible for it. Well, so I don't think the coaching was all of the engagement. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what, what was it about? To, what, what features I, I think, you think one of the reasons was? is that they were really designed for very simple interactions. Um, they were meant to be brief. Um, 
that uh, a lot of these other applications we see tend to be multi-featured. So you'd have the, the thought challenging piece in there with an activity scheduling piece and a logging piece and some mm -hmm. psychoeducational piece. And so you have to really dig into these applications to get the thing that's useful. Um, and so I think that sort of simple design of these applications is actually sort of useful to kind of increase engagement. And I mean, I think that was also shown through at least the way that people engage these things in kind of quick, small bursts. Um, so I think that was one piece of it. Um, I also think that um, because it's an app suite as opposed to a single application, I think one of the problems I think that um, mobile mental health faces is that you know, people, when they go looking for something, they're usually more highly motivated than they're going to be at other things. They might find an application, they might start using it, it might not work, and they might then decide to stop doing it. And you know, they might have a thought like, I tried that digital mental health stuff and it doesn't work. And I think by reframing this as like an app suite, there's a little bit of a reframe that can happen that like, we know not everything works for everyone and that's why we've made out these different options. Um, and so if the, one, if the first thing you use doesn't work for you, maybe something within the suite will. So um, what we find in a lot of other areas of psychology when we have these sort of multimodal sort of stuff is that these um, uh, kitchen sink approaches um, work much better than approaches that have sort of a single, you know, piece to it. I um, mean, so I think by sort of unpacking the kitchen sink and laying out the tools kind of all separately, it kind of helps people engage with that platform. And the, that's just sort of my conjecture. You know, we don't have a lot of evidence speaking to that, but, um, you know, I think that, that that's a piece that's kind of digging into it, but we need to do more research to figure that out. It's a good question. Cool. All right, let's thank Thanks, our everybody. Again.